Good morning. I'd like to welcome everyone here this morning. We usually welcome visitors, but of course right now visitors come from all over and uh, we welcome all of you who are joining us from other locations. I don't have any announcements this morning, but I would like to encourage all of us to really focus our minds during worship on being participants, not just spectators. I think it's easy, especially with uh, pre-recorded lessons, uh, to, to just watch it like a, a program and uh, be spectators. But I'd like us all to think about being participants as we worship God and as we are consciously worshiping together. Uh, Paul says in Colossians 2, 5, that though I am absent from you in body, yet I'm with you in spirit. We are with each other in spirit, and uh, let's concentrate on that. So have that mindset now as we join together in worship. Hi folks. Is God really in control? Who is in charge? Do we make our own decisions? Do we just fall prey to what happens in this world? Or has God created things and he sits on his throne and he rules? And whether or not that's true, what I believe about that makes a big difference. That affects how I act. And while we seem to be entering a period of sustained strife, of struggle, of misery, it's also useful to note that we can see goodness around us. We can see the evidence of God's provision and care and protection. He is the one who does that. We want to affirm that we know that to be true. And so, as we read here from Deuteronomy 10 this morning, we're going to establish that again by these words, that God is in control. He is the one to be worshipped, first and foremost and only. And when we praise Him and trust Him for all things and worship Him no matter what, we look forward to the mighty, great, awesome deeds that He's done in the past and can, can, can continue to do for us today. So we'll read Deuteronomy 10, verses 12 to 21. And now, Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways, and to love him, and to serve the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, to keep the Lord's commandments and his statutes, which I'm commanding to you this day, for your good. Behold, to the Lord your God belong the heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Yet on your fathers did the Lord set his affection to love them, and he chose their descendants after them, you above all peoples, as it is to this day. Circumcise then your heart and stiffen your neck no more, for the Lord your God is the God of gods and the Lord of lords, the great, the mighty, and the awesome God who does not show partiality nor take a bribe. He executes justice for the orphan and the widow, and he shows his love for the alien. For you are aliens in the land. You shall love the Lord your God, you shall serve him and cling to him, and you shall swear by his name. He is your praise, and he is your God, who has done these great and awesome things for you, which your eyes have seen. Lord God, you have not rescued our generations out of Egypt, and yet you have rescued us from our sins. Lord, you are the same, unchanging, and continue to help us in our contemporary Egypts. We want to worship you with our complete beings, body, soul, and spirit, heart, and mind. We declare that we know you are God, and you are in charge, and you alone are to be worshipped for you take care of us like no one else. You have chosen us in Christ as you chose Abraham's descendants. We, by faith, are Abraham's descendants. Mighty God, please remember your promises and take care of us 
You are God. We praise and worship you and only you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good, good morning, church. Glad to have you. Hope you've had a good week. I know we've had some snow and some cold weather, but uh, hopefully things are still okay with you. Um, our songs today, I hope they're inspirational to you and help um, help you through this time of desert and trials that we're going through. Uh, I know it's hard, but I uh, hope these songs help you throughout the week and you can lean on them and, and draw from them. At this time, I want the kids, come on, come up front, come on, we're going to do a song together. Come on, kids. Yeah, come on, come on, I know you're just sitting there. Come on, come up front. All right, let's sing Jesus Loves Me Together, all right? I know you can't see anybody else, but there's other kids at this time going to sing the song with you from uh, from the church, okay? Your friends. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong, they are weak. But he is strong. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Oh, yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. Good job, guys. Really appreciate you. Miss all. Cannot wait to be back together with you. Love you. And um, let's continue with our worship. Nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee, e'en though it be a cross that raiseth me, still all my soul shall be to thee, nearer to thee. Though like a wanderer the sun gone down, darkness me over me, my rest a Steps unto him, all that thou sendest me in mercy give. Angels to beckon me nearer, my God, to thee. to thee, nearer to thee. Or if on joyful wing, cleaving the sky, sun, moon, and stars forgot, upward I fly. Still song shall be nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer, my God, to Thee, nearer to Thee. Beautiful Lamb of God, give
Hello, church. At this time, we'll be partaking of the Lord's Supper. Uh, this is for the bread, which is a represents Christ's body. As we think about what Christ did, he had to come to this earth and become human, and but he did keep his divine attributes as well. As we think about his sacrifice on the cross, I'm going to be reading from Hebrews chapter 2. But we do see Jesus, who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. He says, I will declare your name to my brothers and sisters. In the assembly, I will sing your praises. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, he says, here am I and the children God has given me. Since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. For surely it is not angels he helps, but Abraham's descendants. For this reason he has been he had to be made like them, fully human in every way, in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in service to God, and that he might make atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are being tempted. Let us pray. Father God, we just thank you for your son Jesus. We thank you that he came to this earth and was willing to become human, to take on the form of human flesh and to go through all the trials and temptations that uh, mankind goes through. And we are so thankful that he not only endured those, but that he uh, led a sinless life and therefore could be a perfect sacrifice for you. Please be with us as we partake of this bread and uh, just thank you for your son, Jesus. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. At this time, we are partaking of the fruit of the vine, which is, represents Jesus' blood shed on the cross. We think about Jesus going through life and having to endure the temptations and also sufferings. And worst of all, he had to undergo death on the cross but through that death he rose again and we see in Revelation chapter 5 the vision of the lamb that was slain but had been risen again we we'll start in verse 6 then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders And he took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And the 24 elders fell down before the lamb. And they sang a new song saying, you are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals 
because you were slain and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. And then I heard a loud voice and they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. So praise be to God that Jesus did come to this earth and was willing to die on the cross so that we can have our sins redeemed by him and therefore have a hope of eternal life with God. Let us pray. Father God, just thank you so much for the blood of your son, for the fact that it cleanses us from our sins, that it allows us to be reconciled back to you and help us to remember what your son did for us, that he had to go through this in order for us to be saved. Thank you, Father, for all that you do. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. As we consider our giving, let's think about what God did for us and that he gave his son to come to this earth and be a sacrifice. That is the greatest gift of all. It should inspire us in our hearts to want to, to give back to God. As we know, God gives us all things and we are stewards of those things and need to use them wisely. Um, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19 says, Command those who are rich in this present world not to be arrogant, nor to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God, who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Command them to be good, to do good, to be rich in good deeds, and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age, so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. You may consider mailing in or sending your contribution electronically. Let's pray. Father God, we just thank you so much for your son, for the sacrifice that he made, and for the hope of eternal life. And as we think about in our hearts what we want to give, let's think about not only with money, but also with time and talent and with our very lives. Thank you, God, for all that you do. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.
So I want you to imagine yourself entering to a store that is called Life. The store is filled with all sorts of uh, unique kind of matching trinkets and all sorts of different kind of items. And each item in the store is labeled by what it promises to do for you in your life. So the first aisle that you walk down, you pick up an item, and the item is labeled faster. And so you turn it over and you can look at the list of suggested things that it can do for you. You can get a degree faster. You can lose weight faster. You can get out of being grounded faster. And, and you start to get excited about the possibility of all of the items in this store. You see another item, it's called easier. And then there's one beside it called comfortable. And, and you look into your wallet and try and figure out how much money you have because you're sure you're going to want to buy at least one of each of these things. As you finish going down that first aisle, you turn and enter into the second aisle. And it becomes pretty evident quickly that people hardly ever come down this aisle. There's cobwebs and there's dust. And it doesn't take you long to figure out why. You see an item and it says slower on it. And you wonder why anybody would want to be able to do things slower. It says you're going to get slower results, you're going to make slower improvement, and you're going to make slower progress. So you don't want any of those items. And you, you look at the other items on the aisle, there's difficult and there's painful and there's burdensome, and you decide it's not worth looking at anything else. You go back to the first aisle, you decide to buy one of the product labeled better, two of the product labeled comfortable, and one faster. You would buy more, that's all the money you have. And as you're checking out, you go to the cashier, and as you're at the cashier, you say, it, it doesn't look like anybody buys things from that second aisle. And she replies, nah, that stuff never sells. Uh, nobody ever buys it for themselves, for sure. Sometimes they'll buy it for someone they don't like, but no, that doesn't sell much at all. I want us to think about a question this morning. What are the situations in your life that you might be willing to embrace something that is slower, more difficult, more painful, and more burdensome. Can you think about any situations where you would spend your hard-earned money on buying things that promise less than an ideal result? See, we as a society, we seem to be drawn to careers and relationships and people and choices and habits and products that promise to make things faster or cheaper or easier or better or more comfortable. And that's partially because we place the individual at the center of so many of our actions and decisions. We think the individual should get to decide what makes him or her happy, and that they should be able to chase after and pursue those things that make them happy. We think that the individual should be able to weigh every decision on the basis of how it impacts them or how it affects them. So when the individual takes center stage, there is never any reason to to make that individual do anything that doesn't somehow help them to be faster or better or more comfortable as a result of their choices. Now with that understanding, you might realize that this scripture sounds almost like we're reading a document that has been stolen from a different world, a world that has very different values and very different priorities. The text is Luke chapter 4 verses 5 through 8. Then the devil led him, of course, that being Jesus, up and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And the devil said to him, To you I will give their glory and all this authority, for it has been given to, over to me, and I give it to anyone I please. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered him, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. So the devil makes Jesus an offer. The, the word to you is put in an emphatic position. So today we might see it in bold or we might see it italicized. Because what the devil wants to do is to market something to Jesus. So think about the devil for a moment as if he were a marketing manager for a company. And he keeps telling the company that the only way to market this product is to continue to appeal to people's selfish desires. He says the only question that people really care about is how will it affect me or bless me or benefit me? How will it help make my life more comfortable or easier or better? And so Jesus uses that same 
Sorry, the devil uses that same marketing approach with Jesus. He appeals to Jesus on the basis of selfish desire. The, the, the devil says that these things that have been given to me, I can give to anyone I please. And so the devil is functioning as the ruler of this world, making an offer to Jesus that he hopes Jesus will take him up on. Now imagine that at this point, Jesus and God have a conversation. Maybe a friend said, it's probably a good idea for you to figure out what God's willing to offer as a counteroffer. And God would probably say he is offering something very similar to Jesus. God is saying that by doing things my way, Jesus, you can have glory and authority over the kingdoms of this world. I, I think about a text like Colossians 1, 15 through 16, that says, He, that being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God, for the firstborn of all creation. For in Him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or powers. All things have been created through Him and for Him. So there's this recognition that, that the kingdoms do belong to, in God's plan, to Jesus. Or consider Philippians. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So it seems like at this point the two are offering similar things. If Jesus were to worship the devil, he would get glory and authority of the kingdoms of this world. And if Jesus were to serve God, he would get the glory and authority of the kingdoms of this world. So how would you go about deciding between a tiebreaker? If you had an offer between two companies that you would get the same job at each company, how would you decide which one you would choose to work for? You might be tempted to look at the benefits packages. But what kind of a commitment is involved? How many hours do you want me to work? What are some of your expectations of me in this new job? And we might use some of that as the criteria as we decide which offer we're going to accept. See, the devil's offer is easy, it is simple, it is fast, and it is comfortable. He says, worship me. Literally, he's saying, bow down before me, and that's it. The, the devil offers Jesus a shortcut. He offers him a soft, easy pathway. Jesus knows that life has these kinds of roads. It's a road that he will later call wide and easy. And it's the road that the devil tries to market to Jesus, appealing to his selfishness. Now, what if Jesus turned to God and said to God, well, what are you expecting of me? So the devil just simply wants me to bow down to him, but what about you? And God says, well, First of all, you would need to make all of your decisions based on what I've written in my word. You, you know all of those great things you keep hearing the people down there saying about human autonomy and individuality and freedom? About how you should make your own decisions and follow your own dreams? Well, if you're going to serve me, all of those things need to be secondary to your obedience to me, to my spoken word, and to my will for your life. And so Jesus thinks and he says, okay, well, apart from the written word, is there anything else? And, and God says, I want to just emphasize that a part of my written word means that you'll need to worship and serve me only. See, whatever you worship means you bow down before that thing. And whatever you bow down before, that's what you're going to serve. To serve is the way that you use the energy and the activity and all of the things that make you alive. So if you worship the devil, you will serve him and do his bidding. If you worship me, you can serve only me and do my bidding. So you can't serve me and serve your selfish desires. You can't serve me and serve your greed. You can't serve me and serve your need for popularity. The only thing you can serve is me. Jesus is asking, is there anything else? And God says, yes, there is more. I will lead you by the person of the Holy Spirit. And sometimes the Holy Spirit will lead you into places you don't want to go. Places like this very desert where you are now, places where you may not eat for 40 days and you will ex experience extreme hunger. I do have a plan for you. I have a purpose for you, but you would need to lean on and trust in the leading of the Spirit. And Jesus says, okay, 
God anything else? And God says, yes. Even though you are made in my very form, you cannot regard equality with me as something to be grasped or exploited for your own benefit. There will be no turning stones into bread just to feed yourself. You will need to empty yourself and take on the form of a slave. You will be born in the likeness of a human, and you have to humble yourself and become obedient, obedient to death, even death on a cross. And so Jesus says, okay, so, so let me confirm. Your pathway to glory and authority is to prioritize your will and your word, to be led by the Spirit, and to worship and serve you only by my own suffering, self-sacrifice, and death on a cross. And God says, correct. Any idea which of those pathways you might choose? And maybe you wonder why God wouldn't sweeten the offer a little bit. I mean, surely God could throw in a couple of bonuses that would make the road just a little bit easier or faster or more comfortable for Jesus. But the reality is that God doesn't soften the road for Jesus because God knows that the kind of a road we walk on determines the kind of a people we become. We are formed by the kind of paths that we travel on. So people who choose to walk on the wide and the easy path will be formed into a people who are much softer and much more selfish. But those who travel on the more difficult, narrow path will be formed into a kind of a people accustomed to self-sacrifice and to service of others. See, as I think about these two pathways that are being offered to Jesus, one by the devil, the other by God's will, I want, us to imagine, I want you to imagine that you discovered uh, two ancient lost tribes. And the one lives in a land that is filled with rocks and stones and other hard and jagged surfaces. And ever since the kids are young in that village, they, they walk on those tough surfaces. They develop calluses. They develop the balance that they need for walking on those rugged pathways. But the other tribe that you discover, they, lived in a land, they live in a land with soft grass, with, with the soil that is so nice it contours to your foot, that, that when you take a step in that land, it's as if you're walking on the top of pillows. But what if these two tribes were ever displaced? I suspect that the ones who lived amongst the rocky areas where the pathway was harder could easily adapt and navigate to the grasslands. But those who lived in the grasslands would struggle to walk on the hard, jagged surfaces of that rocky place. See, as I, I think about this, I think about Jeremiah's complaint. There he was overwhelmed by the hardship of his pathway. It seemed difficult and laborsome. And he would look and he would see that the unrighteous were flourishing and he, he would suffer as a result. And what he wants is for God to make it right. And for Jeremiah, making it right means making his pathway just a little bit easier, just a little bit more comfortable. But how did God respond? God says, if you have raced with foot runners and they have wearied you, how will you compete with horses? And if in a safe land you fall down, how will you fare in the thickets of the Jordan? So God says to Jeremiah, this hard pathway is forming you into a kind of a person I need you to be because there's actually some more difficult things I have in store for you. No, I cannot make life easier for you because I need to develop something in you. And God knows that Jesus needs to develop the habit of picking what is difficult, what is hard, and what is burdensome if he is going to fulfill God's will for him. So if Jesus is going to compete with the horses, God cannot make his road easier too. Because this temptation will come up again. In Matthew 16, there are three stories that are combined to tell one story. The, the first aspect or element or chapter of that story is Peter saying of Jesus, You are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Immediately following that, Jesus then speaks of how he must undergo great suffering, be killed, and be raised. And then the third piece that comes next is that Peter begins to rebuke Jesus. Peter is saying, your Messiahship does not and ought not and should not require any suffering. And to Peter's protest, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. 
You are a stumbling block to me, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. And as Jesus says, get behind me, Satan, it reminds me of what was said in Matthew 4.10, away with you, Satan. And Jesus goes on to say, worship and serve the Lord your God. See, what Peter is doing is he's trying to offer Jesus the pathway of Messiahship that is wide and easy, which is the exact pathway that in the temptations that Satan tried to offer him. And so what Peter is doing is he is promoting the agenda of the devil. But Jesus knows he needs to take the Father's more difficult pathway that involves his own suffering and his own death on a cross. And I wonder if there's any lessons or implications for us as we look at Jesus' example in the second temptation. I think that we need to be sure that we review and consider what dominant questions or natural filters we use as we make decisions. See, I think that we all use questions to help us make important life decisions. Somebody once said that, that life isn't about getting the right answers, but it's about asking the right questions. So our human nature tends to want to ask questions like, how does it make me feel? How does it affect me? How will it benefit me? We all have this natural longing and desire to get things that are faster and easier and more comfortable. But then we can begin to filter decisions through those questions that put us at the center of the universe. But Jesus here shows us another way. He filters all of his questions through his relationship with his Father. His questions seem to be, what does my Father wish or will? What does my Father say? Where does the Spirit lead me? And what gives glory to God my Father? See, it's an interesting way that I think that Satan, um, how he appealed to Jesus in the way that God appealed to him. See, remember how the devil put the to you in the emphatic position? I'm offering this to you, to the, to the sinful, lustful, desirous flesh. But then compare that to what happened in Philippians 2.11, where Jesus was highly exalted. Every knee is bowing down to him. Every, every tongue is confessing to him. But we find in the last line that it is to the glory of God the Father. All that Jesus did, he did in obedience to his Father. God never pitched the, the glory and the splendor to Jesus' human selfishness to appeal to that. But instead, it was on the appeal that Jesus desired to make choices based on the Father's glory. And so Jesus then is willing to entertain life choices that weren't for his own benefit, but they were only for the glory of the Father. So how might that process of revisiting our questions about ourselves, how might that impact our choices? You remember that life store in the beginning of the sermon? I mean, what if you began to make buying decisions that wasn't just on the basis of what makes my life faster and easier and more comfortable? What if instead we put the glory of God first, then there might even be times that we opt for something that is more difficult or more burdensome or slower for us personally? See, I think that the devil has made a history-long habit of trying to trip people up with this very same tactic. Just try and seek whatever is easiest and fastest and most comfortable, and he's been doing it over and over again in human history. See, I think that we find ourselves right now in a situation we don't want to be in. And, and many of us would like to find out how quickly we can get out of this stay-at-home phase. Um, we, we struggle. We, we miss people. We think about how uncomfortable it is. And there's something about us that just wants to get out of it. But what if we embrace the idea that maybe there's something that God wants to teach us in this hardship? I, I don't know exactly what God's up to. I don't know exactly what He's teaching us. But I think it's entirely possible that He may be equipping us for something that if we stay on this pathway, as difficult as it is, God may be forming us into the kinds of people He needs us to be. See, as the disciples of Jesus, we shouldn't be surprised to find ourselves in an uncomfortable place. I think we need to be learning that we don't always need to embrace what is fast and easy and comfortable. Sometimes we need to pursue things that might be challenging or difficult or burdensome for us. So my hope and prayer is that we will be a people who learn to see the ways that God can call us outside of ourselves and that God may call us into a life that sometimes we are asked to reject what is easy and reject all of those, those light promises of the devil. 
that instead we might embrace a, li embrace a life that is about obedience to God, to His Word and to His will. It is about following the lead of the Spirit, and it is about seeking to worship God and serve Him only, regardless of what happens to us in the process. May we be faithful to this God who leads us even through the desert. Good morning. Again, greetings to all in Billings and, and around the country who are um, have been worshiping with us this morning. We're glad you had a chance to worship God. We pray that this time we spent together this morning has been uh, uplifting and encouraging in your spiritual life. As we close our service this morning, I'd again like, like to leave you with some words that Jesus spoke to his disciples in a time of comfort with with them these are from john also if you recall last week we had, we were in john 14. this week i moved back in john to john chapter 13 verses 34 and 35. jesus left his disciples with these words a new command i give to you that you love one another as i have loved you that you also love one another by this all will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another May this time of disease, this time of social distancing, be one where, where we are as a congregation, as a people of God, able to show the love of God to all who we come in contact with, our family, with our friends, with those who uh, we meet at the stores, we do our shopping. We, um, this time, want to go to God in prayer as we dismiss this service. Lord, in this time of isolation, we come before you knowing that you are, the, you are sovereign in this world and in your creation. We pray for your continued mercy and care in each of our lives. We ask only for hearts that are attuned to you as we look for ways to serve one another in love. Our prayer for one another is for peace during these uncertain times and patience as we deal with situations that are unfamiliar. We ask that you also help and comfort those who are grieving, especially the Shaws and the Fentons, Fenters. We ask, we know, Lord, that um, also that there are some who are struggling with the frailties of life. Watch over Bar Condi as well, as well as all of our senior members in your kingdom. Be with our young families, help these couples and their children to cope with the changes in education, the changes in the new closeness. Lord, we ask that you keep our eyes open individually for new opportunities to learn about you and deepen our love for you and our love for one another. We offer this prayer in Jesus' name, our Savior, our Redeemer. Amen. Go in peace and enjoy this next week. If there's anything we can do to comfort you or care for you, please call one of the elders. Thank you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. May the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all.